I'm Helen Wright. And I'm so glad that you have come to see me tonight. You know, the Lord allows me to be weak. And when I'm weak, then he's strong. And then, you know, when he's strong, he gets all the glory. And I still get to be weak. <laughs> and you know, it's very easy to understand that it's God and not Helen. You know, I've been telling you some stories about my life. I told you about Chalkville. I told you last week about the Dulord bus. And what I didn't tell you was that the lady who was in charge of Chalkville then was a former nun. And she didn't believe a word I said on Sunday morning. And after the Dulord bus incident, she said, Miss Wright, may I meet with you? So we had lunch. And she said, you know, I never believed what you had to say, but I have seen a change in the children. And when that do Lord bus incident, and all the children, everyone came, I realized that there is truth in what you say. And I want to give my heart to Jesus. Wow. Can you beat that? It is God and God's power at work. There was another man who was her assistant, and he had gone to school at Harvard up north. And he had written a real famous book about Timothy Leary or somebody like that. You know, had done a lot of LSD things. And he came down to work at Chalkville. And he came one morning to hear me to teach, and he could play the organ. So he started playing the organ while I played the piano. And he told me that he asked Jesus into his heart because of that morning time with God. Well, then he went back to a reunion at Harvard, and they asked him what he was doing for a living. And he said, I'm playing hymns at a school. They said, no, what are you doing? I said, no, I'm playing hymns at a school. And he and that former nun married. <laughs> and they both are serving Jesus. You know, I was thinking the other day, I didn't eat Sunday lunch at home for 33 years. I guess it was worth it. Well, after I retired from Chalkville, I became very ill. I have gastritis, and I have to sit up very straight in my chair. I have to wear my clothes with elastic in the side because my belly just swells right up. It's kind of embarrassing, but it's the truth. And since you've come to see me, I just thought I'd tell you. And so I was on a, a medicine, and I got some problems with my electrolytes and got out of balance, and I took too much medicine. And I was having trouble, and they were going to have to take me to the hospital. Well, you know, I didn't make that much at, at Southeastern, so I'm on Medicaid. Well, the only floor they could put me on was a psychiatric ward. <laughs> well, you know, God has plans. So they put me on the psychiatric ward. Well, what was interesting about that is there's some crazy people up there. <laughs> Sometimes they wander around, and they came in and used my chair as a bathroom, and one naked lady came in. And... But the Lord showed me that he was in it and that he was to be trusted. And I was grateful for that opportunity. But my, my niece, Ann, felt like I didn't need to go back to my apartment, so they took me straight from the psychiatric ward to Fairhaven, a retirement home. That was a little difficult. 
I had been in my apartment a long time. But you know, I can trust the Lord. And so when I got there, I thought, this is my new mission field. I will be able to, to share and be happy. And you know what the Lord told me? Helen, I want you to be quiet. Well, that's not the easiest thing for me, to be quiet. I said, why? Lord, these people are a captive audience. <laughs> and he said, I want you to trust and follow me even here. And I want you to remember what I told you and you wrote down in your journal. You know, Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye, Helen. And you know, I wrote in my journal, this is a good verse for those of us who seek guidance and direction from the Lord. It is an assurance that our Heavenly Father is going to move us from weak transmission to a clear channel with no static so we will be able to hear the gentle voice of the Good Shepherd without interference. You know, it's like having a private tutor. He whispers in my ear what to do. The original word in this verse, in the teach thee in the way thou shalt go, indicates the pointing of a finger in a certain direction. And it also implies the shooting of an arrow at a target in such a way as to avoid missing the mark. This word from the Lord is an assurance that we will not drift aimlessly through life, but that he will give us a definite direction and a clear goal to aim for. And I love this last part. He says, and I will guide thee with mine eye. One translation of this phrase says, I will keep my eye upon you to see how you are doing. I think there's a paraphrase here. I will make you skillful and proficient in decision-making, Helen, and will aim you in the right direction. I will keep my eye upon you for your benefit. You know, not too many people talk about God like this. You know, he told me, I couldn't talk like this to everybody, but you are special. There are a lot of old people here who say they know Jesus, but there's no evidence in their life. And my young friends, I have to ask you, do you have evidence in your life of God? Now, I understand if you don't, because I struggle with that, too, because I get mad. You know, the ladies at my table sometimes are mean. They assign you places in the dining hall. And there's one lady, Jane. She's driving everybody crazy. And I went to the Lord, and I said, Lord, she's driving me crazy, too. How are you going to change her? And he said, Helen, it's about you. What? What do you mean? He said, I want you to be crucified with Christ. And when you're crucified with Christ, you're dead. Dead people can't get their feelings hurt. I said, what? How am I going to do that? He said, Helen, you got to trust me. Ask, and I'll tell you. So I did. And you know what he said. <laughs> he said, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up, and I want you to invite her to have lunch with you. I said, what? I don't even like her. And everybody's going to be gone. So I called her and I, I saw her and I said, would you have Thanksgiving dinner with me? And she said, yes. So that day we went down to the dining hall. Miss Helen's voice is hard. <coughs> 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 she had problems with it too. 
<clears throat> and we talked, and the Lord came. And you know, she got sick right after that and had to go to health care. We all dread health care. And you know, I ran into a nurse a couple of weeks later and she said, Miss Helen, I've been nursing Jane in health care and all she talks about is you and how she's seen Christ in you and how when she gets back, she wants to be at your table. Wow. See, Christ is showing me I must live a transparent life. And it's all about love. You can give money. You can give gifts. I don't have anything to give but love. And that's the hardest gift. You know, I, I got something from the Lord about silence. And you know, if you look over there on my wall, I've got it taped up, but I have a copy here. And God said this to me, take time to be alone with me. He is saying to me, through your leaving the task at hand, nothing will suffer. Set your heart to be at peace and sit at my feet. Learn to say no to the man's of men and say yes to the call of the Spirit. And you would think here in the retirement home, I'd have more time. Folks would have more time to sit at his feet. No, everybody's busy. Busy, that's the word. Busy. You might can relate, you young folk. Learn to say no to the demands of the world and be not distressed by the misunderstanding of people. Because you know, most folks aren't going to understand that you need to spend time with God. They want you to meet their need at that moment, right then, right there. You know, I have a friend, Polly, she's older than I am. I'm in my 80s right now and Polly's in her 90s, late 90s. And she said to me the other day, Helen, after lunch, can we visit? And I said, Polly, I can't commit because my time belongs to God. And if he tells me after lunch I can, I will. But if he tells me no, I can't. She said, what? <laughs> she understood, but not everybody understands. But that's all right. I have to serve my Savior. And then he will tell me what to do about others. But will I listen? You know, it's hard to listen when you're busy. At least it is for me. Well, God showed me that I could love people here. And there's a Jewish woman named Miriam. Nobody likes her. She's a little off, if you know what I mean. And she curses at everybody, curses, spits at folk. So it's not hard to understand why they don't like her. But God told me I'm to not ever pass Miriam in the hall without going over and hugging her and telling her, I love you, Miriam. And so I went by her the other day and hugged her and everybody was trying to get into the lunch hall, and there's nothing worse than a bunch of old people at mealtime. <laughs> Especially when they lock the doors. Because everybody goes over and rattles the doorknob. It's not enough that one or two people do it. Everybody does. So there's a piano right outside the lunch hall. And the Lord said, Helen, entertain the troops. <laughs> So I sat down and began to play the piano. I am a pianist, you know. And as I played, I looked over and Miriam was tapping her feet. She always taps her feet when she hears music and doing her hands like this. And I went, I, went, I said, Miriam. And, and the Lord said, go ask that woman over there if she can play the piano. She can. So I went over and I said, can you play the piano? And she said, yes. I said, will you play something? And she started playing the Dark Town Strutter's Ball. 
and I went over to Miriam, and I said, Miriam, do you want to dance? Now, Miriam walks with a walker, very clumsy. And you know, Miriam lit up, and she, she, she kind of said something that sounded like yes. I took it as yes. And I grabbed her hands, and I pulled her up, and there was a doctor standing right behind me I didn't know. And he said, Miss Helen, Miriam doesn't stand up straight. That's the first time I've seen her stand up straight. And she began to move her feet and dance and laugh. Well, all of a sudden, this lady over here said to me, you're crazy. You shouldn't be doing that with Miriam. I bet she doesn't even want to dance with you. <laughs> and I said, would you like to dance? And she said, yes. <laughs> but I just went over and hugged her, and that was enough. You see, what God showed me about the people in here is they're starving for love. Jesus is the key, and he's put it in our hands. When we die to our own desires, he will love through us. You know, I was down in the lunch hall one day and I realized that the maids down there, the servers, are treated terribly. You know, because old people, they're never satisfied. This coffee's bitter. Take it away. These eggs are cold. Yuck. They don't cook anything, they just serve it. So I said, Lord, what can I do? He said, I want you to write them thank you notes. I said, all right, there sure are a lot of them. Well, I find out that they're 18. And you know, my hand is weak. So I, <coughs> excuse me, I got the list of names and I began to write my card. And when I got finished, I took it down and I gave it to Mary to, for her to send it out. Well, after I had done that in a couple of days, the health, no, the dietitian came to me and said, we have 24 more women and they need thank you cards. <laughs> Those thank you notes have transformed our department. Well, I only had 22 cards. So I thought, I'm gonna go down to Elizabeth's room. She always has beautiful cards. She has lots of money. And ask her for two cards. And you know what the Lord said? Helen, you haven't asked me. I said, what? You care about cards? When Elizabeth probably has two? He said, yes, sit down. So I sat down, and he said, I want you to trust me. Go right now down to the gift shop. I said, Lord, I've already looked at all their cards. I got all their thank you cards. All they got are sympathy cards now, because we have plenty of that here. <laughs> and so we have plenty of need for sympathy cards. He said, no, go right now. So I got up, and I went right then. And you know who I ran into in the card, in the gift shop? Elizabeth. I said, Elizabeth, I need two cards. And she said, I have just the two. Come with me. So I did. Do you see how much better it is when God tells you what to do and then you do it? Not only are you obedient, you find out that he really does have your days planned before there's yet even one. Psalm 139. But see, if you're always running and doing and busy, you don't always hear the Lord. Well, some of the women at my table are prejudiced, and most of the women who are the servers are black. And you know, the next day I went in, 
and we were all sitting at our tables and all the servers were down there behind the serving line. And when I walked in, they began to throw me kisses and wave and say, hey, Miss Helen, we love you, Miss Helen. Kiss, 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 kiss. And the ladies at my table, one of them is pregnant. She said, what are they waving at you for? I said, well, sometimes they are not treated well. She said, we've never mistreated anybody at our table. I said, well, maybe not, but I have seen some of them mistreated, and so I decided just to write a few notes. 18 plus 24. <laughs> but I didn't tell her that. And you know, the laundry room ladies, most of them aren't educated, and they come here at night and they wash, the clothes, they wash things for us. And the Lord showed me that I am able to have time with them. So the lady who brought mine up, she sat down and come to find out her little grandson had hurt his eye and she asked me to pray for him. So I did. The next night she brought another lady. I got five laundry room ladies coming up for Bible study at night when they finish. And you know what the Lord told me? He said, Helen, these are the important ones to me. These are the ones I want you to focus on. These are my five sparrows. I love that song. I sang it to him the other night. I can't sing very well, but I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And you know, that's what's important, is to love the ones forgotten, because the Lord never forgets anyone. You know, the other day, I was going down to the nurse's office to get my medicine at night, and there was a lady sitting outside in a chair. And that's not unusual around here because you get tired. I didn't know she'd been waiting for an hour for her medicine. So I just went by and said, hello, how are you? Hope you're fine. Went in, got my medicine, talked to the nurse, had a great time, came out, said, good night, hope you have a good night. And it, she was furious. I could tell. And the Lord said, Helen, I am not pleased with you. I said, Lord, what did I do? He said, you harmed that one although I didn't know. So the next day in the dining hall, a lot happens in the dining hall around here. I said, Catherine, I am so sorry that I got in front of you last night. Will you forgive me? And she said, no. <laughs> I thought, uh-oh. So I went back to the Lord and I said, what do I do now? She wouldn't let me apologize. Because, you know, then I started thinking about that scripture that says, if you don't forgive men on earth, God won't forgive you in heaven. He said, Helen, that's not my way. That's not love like I died for her and died for you. You've got to love her. I said, I don't. And I don't want to. I didn't even know she was waiting. He said, you've got to obey me. So I wrote her a note, and this is what I said. Dear Catherine, I am a woman who claims to have read the Bible from cover to cover, but I don't live what I have read. I'm like what Paul said in Romans 7, what I want to do, that I don't do. And what I do, that's what I don't want to do. I am trying to do the will of God, but I have failed. Would you please pray for me that I would live what I profess? I love you, Helen. And I put that in the mailbox. 
The next day I saw her in the lunchroom, in the dining hall, and she said, Helen, you didn't have to give me that note. I said, oh, yes, I did. She said, well, it's all all right. Do you see? Isn't that an amazing story about forgiveness? I didn't even know I'd harmed her. Do you understand, young folk, that sometimes it's really not always about us? It's sometimes about the other people. And she loves me. Well, remember my friend Miriam? You know, the Jewish woman? She loves me. She's a little scrawny thing with a black wig. And she has it hard here because this is a Methodist home run by the Methodists with Christians, and she's Jewish. She's the only Jewish woman here. No wonder she's mad. And, you know, I told you she's a little crazy. But, you know, I was spending time with the Lord, and he said, go right now down to the dining hall. I said, why? He said, now. I got up, and I went down, and there was Miriam banging on the doors. And two of the serving ladies came out and said, she's been banging for 10 minutes, trying to get in. She's confused. I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, take her by the arm and go over to the piano and start playing the piano. She loves music. So I did. So we sat down and I began to play. And she calmed down and began to, you know, tap her feet, and do her hands. And all of a sudden, four little children, two, four, six, and eight, and their two parents came into the living room. There was no one else there but Miriam and me. And I was playing the piano. And Miriam was tapping her feet waving her hands. And the little kids had been in the car for eight hours and they couldn't sit still any longer. And so I began to play like jingle bells and other things like that. And they began to do somersaults, roll around on the floor. <laughs> Miriam's tapping her feet. I'm playing the piano. The kids are running. All of a sudden, doors started opening from people's rooms and people started coming out on the balcony. All of a sudden, the, the daddy said, well, play something. I want to do something. So I started playing on with Christian soldiers, and he began to march around with the old boy. And then the mother said, I know some Christmas carols. And she said, we, I, began, I knew them all. I began to play. She began to sing. Miriam's tapping her feet, clapping her hands. We had a party for a half an hour. All because when God said, Helen, get up and go down to the dining hall, I heard him and I went. Would you like to hear God like that? Well, you have to close the door and get silent with God. You have to say no to the busyness of the world. Now, I know I'm an old woman, but I haven't always been an old woman. And what I learned about seeking God those are the riches of my life. I'm a rich woman. You know, I've got something else up on my wall. I'll give you a copy of this, too. But, you know, in here is just cement wall, so I can just tape it right up. I like that. Even though this is kind of small, it's good for me. And this is my old age promise. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Can you believe that? That I would bring forth fruit with this old body? It is God. They shall be full of spiritual vitality and rich in trust, love, and contentment. They are living memorials to show that the Lord is faithful to his promises. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. You know, it's important to remember, especially we as Christians, that there is a promise and a command that God has given us. In Psalm 78, and I write it in my journal, and I put it up on my wall so I'll remember because it is my desire. <coughs> Psalm 78, 
starting with verse 5. Well, actually, four. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob, in Helen, and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children, that they should put their confidence in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. That's what I'm to do. I'm to tell the next generation about the faithfulness of God. Well, you know, I told you about the woman who didn't like me. She hated me. You know, when you're a Christian, people going to love you or hate you. If nobody hates you, you might want to check out your life. Well, this woman hated me, and I didn't like her either. And so... Uh, one night, the Lord told me that I had to go down to her room and tell her that I loved her enough to die for her. I may have already told you this story. I'm an old woman, you know. Just stop me if I have. And I said to God, no. I think I hate her too. And he said, Helen, You've got to love her enough to die for her. I said, Lord, I can't. He said, I can. Let me do it through you. And I said, well, I'll write her a note. And he said, no, go now. I said, no. He said, yes. So I went. And you know, she was working on her toilet. It was broken. It was an inconvenient time. But the Lord said, say it anyway. So I stepped in the room and I said, I love you enough to die for you. She said, what? I said, I do. She said, okay. And I was walking back down to my room and I said, what was that all about? She didn't say she loved me. He said, Helen, it's not what they do for you. It's what you let me do through you for them. I am your reward. And that reminds me, they had a talent show a couple of weeks ago, and I've been asked by several people to play, but God had told me no, so I wasn't playing. Because there are some jealous people here. You know, when you get old, you can get jealous too. Until the day before the talent show, People have been practicing for months. And the Lord said, Helen, I want you to play. I said, what? They've already printed the program. He said, you go talk to the lady. So I went down and talked to the lady. And she said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, if I'm going to be in it, you've got to read this paper. And I had written the words to my tribute. How can I say thanks for the things thou hast done for me? Things so undeserved that you came to give your love for me. The voices of a million angels cannot express my gratitude. All that I am or ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the things he had done. She said, I don't think I can do that. Everyone else just had one line. So she went and asked the person in charge, and she said, well, if you contact all the other 30 people in the show and they want to write something new, we'll do it then. Well, it took 30 pages about. Everybody wanted a lot. Well, there was a man who had been at the Alabama Theater as a ventriloquist. The judges didn't know I was going to play because I was an add-on. So he was last, right before me, and they had already awarded him the prize, first prize. But the spirit of the living God fell upon me, and I knew from the first moment when I dropped the first chord, 
bam, 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 bam. <laughs> that I was going to win because God was playing the piano. Well, after I finished and they had read the words, the lady in charge went to the judges and she said, Helen Wright won first prize. They said, we, can't, we only have one. We gave it to the ventriloquist. But you know what God told me, Helen? I'm your prize. And that was enough for me. And it worked well with the ventriloquist, too. <laughs> See, when you let God do it, you don't have to worry about whether people think you're good. And a nurse came up to me not long after that and said a lady had told her that as she heard the words read, and as I played the piano, she gave her heart to Jesus. Wow, can you beat that? You know, it reminds me of 2 Chronicles 20. You know, we talked about 2 Chronicles 18 last time you came. 2 Chronicles 20 has Jehoshaphat back home. And I taught this lesson to Roseanne, and she's still trying to learn it. You know, I love Roseanne. I was in the hospital another time, and I was so cold. I was shivering, and I was out in the hallway getting x-rays, and I was praying to God that he would send an angel. And I opened my eyes, and I saw Roseanne. And I said, are you a vision? She said, no, ma'am, just Roseanne. And she tucked that blanket up around my neck and answered a prayer. Little did I know that she had come and found me. She didn't even know I was in the hospital. God told her, and they found me. And she told them that she was Dr. Coleman from Nashville. <laughs> here to see Miss Helen Wright. And they brought her down the physician's elevator <laughs> and escorted her right in. They wouldn't even let my family come in. I love her, and God used her. But when we looked at 2 Chronicles 20 together, she had never heard of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat made a big mistake in 2 Chronicles 18, but he learned a good lesson, that God is faithful. And you know, God had given him peace on every side. Nobody attacked Jehoshaphat in Judah until he disobeyed. And in 2 Chronicles 20, three armies are coming against Jehoshaphat, and they're so little, they're not going to be able to fight. And you know what they said to Jehoshaphat was, three armies are coming against you. That's true. We have to be careful, especially as leaders, because when we sin, we affect the little ones under us. Verse 3 says, and Jehoshaphat was afraid. I've been afraid before. But what he did next was very good. He turned his attention to seek the Lord. It's okay to be afraid. But we have to remember, the next thing to do is to turn our attention to seek the Lord. And then he proclaimed a fast, and all of Judah gathered. Now, we had the first prayer of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 18. I'm sure all you cross-stitchers have been working on that for me. <laughs> but this second prayer is from a man who has fallen, who understands the grace of God and understands his own weakness, but the power of God through him. He began to pray in verse 6, and he said, Power and might are in your hand, so that no one can stand against thee. Didst thou not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land and give it to the descendants of Abraham, thy friend, forever? And they lived there. Verse 9 said, Should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine? That's a little like old age. You know, old age is the valley of the shadow of death. We will stand before this house 
and before thee and cry to thee in our distress and thou will hear and deliver us. And look at verse 12. O oh, our God, will thou not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. That young people is a wise man. And you see what happened is they all stood there in verse 13 with everything that was important to them. And when you look at verse 15, God spoke through a prophet, and the first word he said was, listen. That's just what I've been telling you. You have to begin to train your heart to listen, because when you're in a hard place, it's hard to listen. Your heart's going pow, 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 pow. Listen. Thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. When we listen to God, he always puts the perspective back in order. He tells them how they're going to come. He gives them reconnaissance. He says, you don't need to fight this battle. God cares about you because he's going to fight on your behalf. And you know what? In verse 19, the Levites begin to praise God. And you know what? That's where the battle was won. When they began to praise God. And you know, Jehoshaphat told the singers that they had to go out in front of the army. I bet there were a lot of sopranos with laryngitis. And they were to sing, give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. And as they began to sing, God set ambushes for those three armies and they killed themselves. Do you see, young people, God hardly ever works like you think he's going to. He tells you to do crazy things sometimes. When Miriam stood up and began to dance, and that woman said, you're crazy, you know what I told her? Yes, I am crazy. I've been crazy since I was a little girl. But we're afraid to be crazy for God. But he is the only one who has the answers. He is the only one who knows where the enemy is. He is the only one who knows where you fear. You know, when you were little, you were afraid of the dark, some of you. I didn't like to put my feet out from under the covers because I was afraid something would grab it. But you know, as I got older, my fears changed, but they're still irrational. Because when I get in the presence of God, he reminds me, Helen, you are mine. And even if I allow hard times to come to you, I will deliver you. And that is important. You know, I told you that I had done a classical record. What I didn't tell you was that my arms had had surgery and I had not played the piano in 10 years. My nerves were dead. And you know, I gave up my classical piano career and my friends told me that I had committed career suicide. But do you know what? I'm the only one from that group of musicians who ever made a record of her own. And Southeastern Bible College paid for that record. I did not. Isn't God amazing? He knew what would bring him glory. I need to pray just for a second and ask God what he wants me to talk about to finish our time together. He said it is important to finish well. It is important 
to finish well. But many times we forget to prepare. We just think about the finishing. We think about how hard our life is, how difficult it is to hear what God wants us to do. You know, I love that old hymn, I'm dwelling in Beulah land. I thought Beulah mean, meant happy, but you know it means married. Remember we talked about that, that we will know in Hosea, we will no longer call him master, but call him husband. And he talks about that our land will be married, that our shame will be taken away. Well, I call this room right here Beulah land, that he is my husband and that this is a place of worship. And I, I, I wanted to sing this, I'm living on the mountain. <clears throat> I have a blown vocal cord, you know. Underneath a cloudless sky, I'm drinking from the fountain right here in my room, right here on my way to health care, on my way to glory. I'm drinking from the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply for I am dwelling in Beulah land. You know, my friend Miriam, they had to take her up to health care. She has Alzheimer's, you know. And I'd been sick and the doctor was up in health care. And so I, I went up there. I was trying to go up there and I was so weak I had to wait. And one of the nurses saw me and she said, Miss Helen, you look so weak. You don't look like you can make it. So she sat me down in the chair. And as I sat in the chair, who would come by but Miriam, looking confused. And I said, Miriam. And she said, oh, it's you. And I couldn't hug her and kiss her because she was hugging me and kissing me so much. She loves me because she knows I love her. And I said, Miriam, what's wrong? And she said, they've moved me so often here lately. I'm lost. Can you help me find my room? And I said, Miriam, I'll pray. So I got her a chair and sat her down by me. And I prayed and all of a sudden, here comes a nurse. And I said, could you please help Miriam back to her room? And she said, I'd be happy to. And as I sat there, the Lord said, do you see why I have you up here today? I know your stomach is hurting, but sometimes I have to have things happen to you so you'll be in the right place at the right time. And so when I saw the doctor, he was able to assure me that this pain in my belly is not the old sickness come back, that the old things that had caused so much trouble and worry, that's not what it was, and I was going to be fine. Can you beat that? You know, my prayer for you, young people, is that you would understand that it is God who does his work through us. And that is my prayer for me every day. And the Lord was very gracious to me. Miss Helen lived there from about her 84th year till she was 95, maybe 83. I think she was there at Fairhaven for 12 years. And I was able to be with her toward the end of her life. And I was visiting with her the April before uh, at Easter uh, 2004 and she had given me a blessing and she had talked about the Bible study that I teach here and that she prayed for you. And there were specific prayers that she prayed and we were able to trace it back and some of the people who came to know Jesus were direct results from prayers in certain weeks that Miss Helen had prayed there in health care. 
And you know, Miss Helen was the woman who people would come in and kiss and love. And even when she began to have problems at the end and, and was very, it was very difficult for her to be touched or when they would have to give her shots, very difficult for her thin skin to, to take uh, the pain. Uh, she would apologize and, and she would, would ask them to forgive her and then she would just talk about how life was hard. And then when Miss Helen slipped into a coma uh, those last few days that I was with her, well, they called me on Saturday and told me that she had had a stroke. And I'd been able to be with her a few days before that. And uh, we just sat in silence. And every now and again, she would say, do you see those people over in the corner? And I would say, no, ma'am, but I'm sure you do. And she would say, maybe it's just I'm hallucinating. And I said, no, I think God's beginning to open the door of heaven. When you see the angels, let me know. She just laughed. Because Miss Helen wasn't ready to go. Her niece kept saying, Miss he she kept saying, Helen, pray that the Lord will, let's pray that the Lord will just take you. And she said, oh, no, I want to tell of the faithfulness of God to the next generation, and I don't want to go until I have done that. Not me. I'd have been wanting out of there. <laughs> Not Miss Helen. She knew that her life had a larger purpose even in the degradation of her late years. Her loss of independence. But her dependence on the Lord enabled her to go through that last time, those years of pain and difficulty. So when I went in and she, one side of her face was... Uh, uh, affected by the stroke. She was lying on her side and they weren't really sure if she would recognize me and I, I came in and I, I leaned over and I said, hey Miss Helen, it's Rose. And she looked up and her eyes kind of blinked and she tried to smile and she and I knew she knew who I was. And I started telling her the stories of, of how she and I met and, and God's faithfulness to me and the stories she used to tell me because she began to forget. And, I, and she would say, now tell me again how we met. I taught you piano? Wow. And then I'd start telling her her stories that she forgot in her voice. <laughs> and she would say, I did that? Wow. Thanks, Rose, for reminding me. And as I told, I uh, talked to her about the stories of her faithfulness to me, her uh, nephew-in-law and niece were in there and after they left he said to his wife I was amazed at the story she would, were, was telling about Helen and I want to go back tomorrow and hear some more stories and they brought their daughter now their daughter Caroline and JC or JT I can't remember what the initials are of her new husband They'd gone on a honeymoon and were caught in a tsunami. Now, Miss Helen did not know that they were there. She didn't watch the television. She didn't have a newspaper. She didn't know where they had gone on their honeymoon, but she just knew they were gone. And one night, the Lord woke her up and said, Helen, get up. You have to pray for Caroline and JT. And I want you to get up and find their picture in your album and put it up on the wall, tape it up so you can see it right from your bed so you can pray for them. So she got up and she had a difficult time getting over there, but she did. She found the picture. She taped it up over a picture on the wall and he said, now get a picture of Anne, their, her mother, and tape that up too because she's going to have trouble too. So she prayed all night and the verses that the Lord gave her were verses like, the floods will not overtake you. The Lord will deliver you. She couldn't understand what these verses were about, but she prayed all night. The next morning, Ann came in, and, or that after, I guess that afternoon, the next afternoon came in and said, Helen, I need to tell you something. She said, what's wrong with Caroline? And she explained to her about the tsunami, and that they, they did not know if they were alive. Well, they were alive, and their story was written up in the Birmingham News, 
she and JT were going to go snorkeling that day and decided that they wanted to go up on the highest point in that island and spend time in the Word. And as they were spending time in the Word on top of the mountain with the Lord, she decided she would take a picture of the water. And as she put her camera up, all of a sudden they began to see the water being sucked out from the shore. And all of a sudden they saw from their vantage point, which was the highest point, the tsunami hit. So they rushed down to do all they could to help people. They were stepping over bodies. It was just awful, they said. And um, very, very difficult situation. And uh, almost didn't make it to a safe place as they were going through the debris. But they called Ann and said they were fine and that they were able to get a flight home. And Miss Helen heard this story and she said, I have been praying all night for them. Now, if the Lord will tell a woman who has no idea what's going on, wake her up from a deep sleep to pray for the safety of these kids, I want to live a life like that. But let's remember what, what God said to me when I said, I want to be just like Miss Helen. He said, are you willing to pay the price? And I said, Lord, yes, I believe. Help my unbelief. But if that's a life available to me, help me live that life. Well, as Miss Helen was in her coma, a steady stream of maintenance workers maids, laundry room women, servers in the cafeteria began to come by her room. And they would come in and they would talk about how much she had loved them. And as I stood in the hall and watched this steady stream of workers come in, the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, kings and queens are not coming to the bedside of Helen Wright but my sparrows are. The ones she cared for faithfully, truly loving, truly dying to self, truly giving away what I gave her. That's the life worth living. She has finished well. And at 1.30 uh, on the Wednesday morning after that, Miss Helen went to be with the Lord. And you know, I couldn't sleep. I was here. I taught Bible study that Tuesday night. I was supposed to fly to Seattle the next morning. And I could not go to sleep. I was so tired. I was exhausted. And when I got in bed, I was wide awake. And I was wandering around the house, just praying for Miss Helen, just thanking God for her and until about a quarter of two. And then I went to sleep. I appreciate your giving me the opportunity to share some of the stories of Miss Helen. I am writing a book. Please pray for me. Um, it's easier to tell them than to write them. Um, but my intent and my hope is that we would be encouraged by her life, a woman hidden away. Um, I'm going to try to put the notes that we've had up on my website, RoseanneColeman.com. Don't expect it anytime soon. <laughs> but uh, those of you who know me, oh, yeah, it's really true unless someone helps her. Um, but keep checking that, um, and we'll see uh, as that progresses. But, you know, as, as the Lord challenged me in this time, I pray that he would challenge us all, especially as we look to the fall in our Desperate Women Tour, uh, looking at Old Testament desperate folk, eating some of their bread, walking in their sandals, um, seeing how God met them, seeing how they responded, asking ourselves how we can respond in similar situations, um, to see that God is faithful, and that you would realize, even in the small way, even if you think it's a small way, that you will affect the life of someone else because God has planned your days out before there was yet even one. Psalm 139. So if you've come to this study and you're discouraged, 
be encouraged. If someone has told you you're not cool or you're not living life like you should be, you just go to the Lord and ask him how to do that. Don't let someone else judge you into a place where you should not be. Now, we need to confess our sin. We need to look at ourselves and take it to God and say, you know, here's where I failed. He's not unaware of that. And he might tell you to walk down the hall and tell someone you love them enough to die for them. And they may say, well, I'll just kill you now. <laughs> Life is not always so kind, is it? It doesn't always have that happy ending. But when we walk with Jesus and we realize when we close our eyes at night that he is with us, he never leaves us, he never forsakes us, that he really believes we're wonderful. If we belong to him, he looks at us through Jesus. We are his beloved. He might not call you baby like he does me, but he calls you some special name, maybe even your own. And that he so desires for you to know that. Oh, that we would live lives worth living. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Miss Helen. Thank you for what she did for me. Faithfully praying all those years. Believing what you were going to do in me. Oh, that I would be Elisha to her Elijah. Oh, Father, only you can accomplish that. Oh, that we would all be the Elishas to the Elijahs in our lives. For you have planned for that. It is your purpose and will that we would see your faithfulness in our lives and then tell that to the next generation. Oh, Father, free us from our bondage. Open our hearts that you can pour in your love. For it is only love that will transform us and only love that will transform others. Give us the ability to be courageous, to be fearless, to be obedient, to be women and men who abide in you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the vision that they have for our community. I pray that you would be with us as we go forward in our journey. May we have the lives that other people around us say, I want what you have. Oh, Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. And thank you that that is your plan and your promise. Thank you for this time together. And once again, I am grateful for another opportunity to speak well of your name. And I ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.